Okay. Um, Ivan, I, I see you're there. Um, we'll get you up later on. Uh, Fazana, are you presenting, pitching, practicing? Okay, well, we'll we'll get underway. I mean, we've got a couple of people coming in who've registered. I don't know where they are at the moment, but um, oh, here we go. There's Alex. Okay. Yeah, hi, Alexi. Welcome. Hi there. Good to see you again. Um, what's happening neil what's happening busy got three events on today this one and another two in the evening yeah i'm coming um, to the evening one i'm gonna pitch if you don't mind uh not tonight uh we well you can do but we charge for the pitch tonight yeah, that's fine i'll uh, i'll manage <laughs> okay um I'll let Craig sorting that out. So I'll let Craig talk to you later on that one. Yeah. Um, for our for our actual pitch events, um, we charge a hundred pounds um, for the pitch, just a nominal fee. Um, well, you you gotta you gotta get something out of it too, right? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, you know, we we do we're doing now the the free pra these events, free practice your pitches. We're doing the free workshops, um, which help get investment ready, which you've been to, I know. Um, and then obviously actual uh, pitch ones as well. Although funny enough, during the workshop ones now, what, we've, what we're getting is a number of um, people who we know as investors as well, coming on to those to catch early investment opportunities. So it's quite interesting uh, what's going on there. Now, obviously you know me, Rod, you've got my details as well, Fazana. I'm sure you're there, uh, Ivan as well. What we'll do is, Rod, if I'll stop showing my screen for now. Um, right, there we go. Um, so, Rod, if you want to take the floor. Okay, um, this is my first time on a virtual pitch or any pitch. I just um, need some directions. I'm, pre I'm putting up the PowerPoint, if that's okay. Yep, yeah, sure. Right, now what you're going to need to do and again, this is a whole learning. The whole idea of this is learning. So, at the bottom on your on your um, on your Zoom screen, there should be something that says "Share Screen." Yep. So you need your PowerPoint open. Okay, let me um, do that. Okay. So you open your PowerPoint, and then you click on um, the Share Screen button at the bottom. Oh, is a PDF okay? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, that'll work. Okay, share screen. There we go. Right, got it. Now I'll turn my video off. Hang on one second. Where's my video? I'll cut my mic as well. So if you want to carry on, Rod. Okay, great. Do you want me to go um, straight into a my five minute pitch now? Yeah, yeah. and then we can have okay. a chat and sort of come back and. Right, yeah. I'll, um, I'll jump in at the deep end. Just before I start, one question with these pictures. Is it, sounds an unusual question, but is it better to stand up or sit down? Because most pictures are obviously presented standing up. If you yeah, I think, yeah. Stand... <laughs> the, way, the way the world's changed now, Rod, everybody's sitting down on these things. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, I, yeah I mean, when, when, you, when we do the physical ones, yeah, what we do, people stand up, we've got a little rostrum. Um, in the room at, at, at the brand exchange in the city where we hold them um, and we've got all the the tech stuff set up sound systems throughout the room the, the projectors and everything else but nowadays you know everybody sat down okay yeah no no problem i might be able to stand up this afternoon by the way i'll um just arrange a whole load of files and see what i can do okay thank you okay um, um thank you neil I'll, I'll um i'll start with my five um five minute pitch um 
Read Between My Eyes is a, a new space for well-being. We all have so many differences and similarities. The missing key to improving well-being is by understanding and accepting these through shared experiences. My real understanding of well-being literally started when I was on top of the world in my previous career as a mountaineer when I'd been paid to climb Everest North. Two years later, I was at the bottom when my youngest daughter at the age of uh, 10 months old lost the ability to see and move overnight. While I was trying to improve her way of life, my well-being got directly impacted and then I spent nine years researching this fast-growing industry and set up Read Between My Eyes in late 2018. We've created a, the first healthy social digital space where we can learn, share, measure and compare who we truly are. The problem today has never been higher. 70% of current well-being issues can be directly related to the current usual social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat and Twitter. This reason is we live in a, a life of sex culture with a need for instant gratification. Also, there's no doubt that COVID has certainly exacerbated this growth um, and also exacerbated the use of social media. The market opportunity is evident. 28% of 16 to 44 year olds have downloaded wellbeing applications. The SOM market in the UK alone is 21.3 million. Globally, it's 343 million. And the evidence for a new healthy social media platform is evident. We've carried out in-depth research with a number of very good organizations and companies um, from NHS, Who Mind, Calm Headspace, and the list is growing. But we've discovered a product which doesn't currently exist. So what is Read Between My Eyes? It's an instantly accessible social well-being solution founded on approved models. We're looking at a B2C subscription model at two pounds per month or 24 pounds per year, which has been price tested. And the whole idea is to get people to promote their real life personas over their digital facades. The product itself can be divided into two dashboards. Firstly, there's the private wellbeing dashboard where members can access targeted information so they can follow practical and prog progressive actions. Um, they'll also be able to look at their historic data and find out how their well-being trends have improved. And they'll have direct access to a selection of multiple well-being pillars, such as meaningfulness, engagement, acceptance. The social well-being platform enables all users to see how sharing information can not only benefit themselves but others, but to keep focus on valuing diversity, differences and similarities. The team itself, along with, um, with me, is World Leading Behavioural Psychologist Professor Timothy Marsh and also Rob Kemp, um, previous CTO of Cheap Flights and Mondo, a meta online search company that sold to Kayak. In summary, we're looking for 250,000 for premium ready launch this year. SES, SEIS approved. Current MVPs were very successful with 70% of users confirming the well being improved. Um, we're at level five. We've got huge high data value potential because we're getting information that no one normally provides. And our key USPs are focusing on prevention over cure being the first healthy social media platform which directly combats the growth of mental health issues created by social media and we're the first platform that supports complete freedom of expression to benefit that. Thank you. Um, any questions? I've got no idea how that took, how long that took. Is that... Um, um, it wasn't that long. Uh, I think you started about, it was about four minutes or so just over I believe. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, so the ask at the moment is 250 um which is fine what on what valuation or what as a potential investor would they be getting 20 percent we've got an offer okay so 250 for 20 percent okay i think you should mention that rod 
okay yeah like what you are you know what you know, basically what you're doing why you're doing it yeah it's fine uh, how you're doing it got that uh, who you are um, what you're asking for and obviously what you're offering yeah um, the SEIS thing is vital as we've, we've talked nowadays at the workshops and um, you see legals data that we have and they, they present at um, our workshops uh, say that over 90% of the uh, startups funded in the UK have SEIS yeah, it's just an interesting fact that uh, if you don't, you're basically not going to raise, but uh, that's fine. Uh, Craig, do you want to just say, Rod, Craig's doing the event tonight. Craig's my business partner in Dubai. Um, do you want to have a, a, some comments there, Craig? Yeah, look at him. Well done. It's never easy doing this for the first time, um, virtually or, or in person. Um, I would just, but like Neil said, um, I'd get the numbers quicker. Um, what, what what the opportunity is and, and, and what you're offering, like like Neil mentioned, um, obviously it's a membership platform. Um, there's a membership option. How, how are you going to attract those members? Is, is key for anyone that's going to invest in your business. That's that's the part, the, the foolproof part that you need to have 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 down. Um, so I I touch on that uh, for sure and. And yeah, really, really a breakdown of what you're going, to, what the capital, capital you're going to use, um, how you're going to use the capital that you take into the business. That's that's also a key, a key um, parameter that I would like to check. If I was investing personally. Thank you. No problem. But that helps. On the obviously, and, and I'll talk about this more later on. But um, we suggest people. Uh, who are looking at raising contact everybody they can possibly do LinkedIn rods one of the best ones um, There we would normally suggest is just a couple of sentences saying what we're doing or what you're doing um, To generate some interest because it will get the deal out there um, Then we normally suggest like a one-page teaser that Has got the relevant information, but doesn't say too much then what you've got up now, which is your short uh, term or, or short uh, pitch uh, deck which is fine because that can be sent to people looking for more information uh, then on the capital raise journey you, you're gonna need obviously your business plan financials and also a, a long deck which the better way to describe it is simply a, a graphic looking example of what your what your business plan is um, that's where we're at there as far as uh, your ability to take money at the moment, Rod, what's uh, what's the situation? Uh, do you use seed legals, or you you've got a somebody yeah. else, a lawyer who? Yeah, so um, we've got a, an FD in place which we um, took on board last week, and so we're in we're preparing our, our financials at the moment. Um, this is literally the first um, time that we've started approaching um, anyone for funding, only because we haven't been ready. Um, we've been spending all of our time on developing the product, making sure it works and testing it. Um, we've also about to take on, um, on board um, a co-founder. and We're in final stages of interviewing to cover the marketing aspects, which you both mentioned, um, the aim of which is to drive the community forward um, so people can sign up to the, the, the freemium platform. Um, in terms of costings, we, um, we pretty... We've got some pretty good figures there. We're nearly there now. Um, but we, we only spoke, Neil, on, what, Friday, I think it was? Yeah, yeah no, no, it's fine, yeah. Um, so what is it, today, Monday? Um, and literally, we've only um, been ready to start looking for funding now because we wanted to be in a much stronger position and have a, a product which worked. Yeah, of course. Ev evidence to prove that. And, and also some traction. We have got a fair bit of traction. Um, this information will be ready um, for us, not, not tonight at six, um, but we'll have most of it ready by um, the end of this week. And then we'll have a co-founder's place secured. Um, and then we've certainly got a business plan together. We've got um, some sales targets that we are looking at. We've got sales assumptions and cost assumptions in place. So we can give a clear breakdown on what the 250 is needed for. 
Um, and all that information can be supported in a, in a long deck like you, like you guys suggested. But we've de deliberately held on, um, prevented from marketing. Um, and, and in fact, we only posted our first two blogs on the site um, last week. And we only set up a, an account on Facebook last week um, to, to actively put that forward. So it's really early days in terms of getting or validifying our market at the moment. And, um, and we're about to start. Okay. Mm. All right, so I, I missed it. Is it just a website or is it gonna be an app as well? It's an, it's an app, yeah. It's it an is app. an app, okay, fine. So you've got your... Um, all right, and is that, that is that up at the moment or how? how... It's, up, it's up and running now. Okay. All right. Yes, uh, yeah, so it's um it's up and running. Um, we're still making some final tweaks and changes, but it's um it's now fully functional. The freemium model's functional. The premium's not. That's where the um, investments needed to develop our current model to get to premium level. Um, in about four to six months, we reckon. I would mention. I would mention that you do have the basic model completed. And you're just working on the on the updates to, the, to all the other areas. It's, it's nice for people to comprehend where you are um, in the journey and how far how far they've got to go, so that they can do their own calculations in their head and um, to, to time frames. Okay, yeah. thank you. Just a quick. It, uh, this is from Ivan. Hi, Ivan. Um, Hi Rod, thanks for your presentation. I have a question, isn't SEIS limited to 150 pounds? Yes it is, is the answer. Perhaps on your, do you have uh, SEIS and EIS advanced assurance? SEIS. So you've got, uh, okay, so you're gonna need EIS as well, ideally. Would it be um, worth in these early stages of pictures to, um to just therefore focus on 150 and then look at another funding round later on, for example. Yeah, if, if, if you can do with 150. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, if your financials and your business plan can accommodate 150 instead of 250, yes. I mean, you, 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 you're an early, st your initial stage raise, therefore, you know, you, you're talking about two hundred and fifty for twenty percent of the company. That's a that's a that's a big offer. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, and again on the workshops, I don't know if you've been to our workshops, but C leaders will tell you that in the past, capital raising has normally gone on around three stages of raises, an average of around about fifteen percent at each stage. Maybe it's six to or twelve months apart, whatever it might be. So at the end of the the journey as such to there, founders have given away 45% of the company. Um, what they're doing at the moment now, and what they've seen with the recent raising, especially during the last few months, is that people are asking for uh, less money and are raising more continuously. Uh, um, but they're also advising startups to maximize the 150 SCIS. Okay, so it sounds like it's a good point to start on 150 for a, uh, a lower percentage of equity. Yeah, you might also want to, Rod, as a bit of advice, you want to, and if, what, what is happening at the moment, and uh, if you're f familiar with seed legals or not, they do uh, what's called seed fast, which is basically an agile funding or pre-funding round uh, raise, whereby you can take the money in now before you do an actual raise. Um, it's like a convertible note on the basis that you will be offering the shareholders a discount on the share price when it's raised at the round of, let's say, 15% or 20% off the, off the round price. But it enables you to take cash now. Yeah. Um, we're, going to, we're going to sign up to Seed Legals. Um, that's our next step as well. Right, okay, because... That. That's going to give you everything you need. Um, and most of the stuff on there is 
free to, to, to a certain extent. Obviously, they charge for the seed fast notes and, and such like. But um, that then you can get in contact with with them and they'll run you through how that works. And that's what's happening with a lot of um, companies at the moment. So you don't actually have to put a valuation in. Yeah. So in okay. theory, if you know, you could give a guide perhaps of looking to raise what sort of percentage of equity, but you don't have to. Um, then if the thing just balloons in the next 12 months and you do, you do, you do another round, obviously your valuation is going to be at such a level that you don't need, well, you won't be giving away perhaps 20% of your company. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know, that's my advice at the moment. And it's invaluable. Seed Legals, it's, it's, I mean, they're, you know, an online startup funding platform. The, 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 with all the legal bits on there, but the advice and the data they collect is phenomenal, um, which is very, very useful when, you know, they come onto workshops and explain to everybody, look, you know, this is where things are working at the moment. They had a company just recently raised 3.3 million uh, on a seed fast note, <laughs> which is unheard of. So basically they've got three and a half million in or 3.3 million in, um, and they haven't done a funding round. They've sort of set the funding round for next year. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so I even hope that answers your question. Uh, it covers that there. Um, okay, I don't know who's a few people are supposed to be coming in, aren't? Um, can anybody who's in in the meeting room here at the moment who wants to practice their actual practice their pitch just pop, pop a message in the chat room for me, will you? And then I'll get you. Um, Get you on board, Ivan. I know you do. Um, do you want to? Sorry, Rod. Can you stop sharing your screen now? Yeah. Right. That's what you need to do again tonight. So that takes it off. There's Ivan. Hi, Ivan. Hi. How are you going? Um. Um. All right. That's better. Perfect. Now I can see. Okay. It. Right, Ivan. Yeah. I'll turn my video off and let you carry on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just a second. Um, okay. So hope everybody can see my screen. And uh hi everybody, I'm Ivan, founder of Face On technology-based startup that allows you to choose your personality on a video stream. People like video masks, like the ones you can see in Instagram and Snapchat. However, this is very hard to create masks by yourself. Top mask technologies are not able to support video streaming on phone and video streaming platforms itself still suffer from good performance. As a solution, we introduce face-on technology, which allows you to create a new personality mask for you and your friends to use in just one click. Add picture of any personality in your app and start filming. It's that easy. Here, I just uploaded one photo of David Bowie, turned out my selfie camera, and had a lot of fun pretending to be a rock star. Our technology also allows you to video stream using your own personality mask which is not possible with any app or website at the moment. Imagine talking to your friend over Skype and being able to switch 10 different personas as you go. This is what makes us unique. There is no other technology at the moment which allows you to do that. And people are ready to pay for it. Our business model is focused on B2C mobile apps we are developing. We plan to release two apps to the market, Payson app, which allows to create and use unique video effects without technology, and Chatic, video chat platform, which allows to apply our masks to your video. We are also keeping in mind the opportunity to license our technology and sell it to video chat and video stream businesses. First app we will release will be Face On. This is standard premium app where we charge two euro per month for the opportunity to use custom photos as a mask for your video. This gives us uh, over 2 million euro per year, giving 100 
thousand active subscribers. And market of video effects is extremely active, and tens of millions of people use uh, AR and AI effects for their video content every day. And the second and final application for our technology lies within area of video streaming. A video stream app and platform Chatic will provide impressive AI masks and effects and will take its place in video chat market. We will provide additional effects and features for Chatic video chats or subscription fee. Video chat market at the moment is extremely big and billions of users use video chat every month and many of them will become our customers. A little bit of how Portfolio we plan to go to market. Our go to market for the face on app consists of three key components. Collaboration with celebrities on such stream platforms as TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, and Twitch. Ads on the same social networks, customer can post their content on. And viral videos and posts created to show the fun and joy a product can bring. At the moment, we are the only company which brings ability to add masks to video streams on phone. Other companies either focus only on photo content or do not allow to use their functionality on phone. Their technology is just not there. And here's a roadmap for 2020. As you can see, we are currently in the early stage of Android and iOS app development. This app will be released in October to the market. And next up is creating a video chat platform, which will go live in third quarter of 2021. To reach our goals, we need around 400,000 euro in seed investment. This money will go mainly to marketing to create viral effect around our apps, iOS development, and building powerful data science team. You can see our market expenses in more detail. We are targeting three markets, Russian speaking, Spanish speaking, and American. Our focus is on Russian market since it's the least expensive for the most results. Our estimation is that with that marketing campaign, we will be able to get at least 10 million downloads for Android and iOS in the first two months. Which in return will provide us with a revenue of around 100,000 euro per month for the rest of 2020. Uh, we will take a loss in uh, uh, third quarter of 2020, and then our expenses will be somewhat covered until the release of video stream platform. We plan to cover all expenses in uh, for fourth quarter of 2021. And last but not least, I want to talk about the team that we have. I have two amazing co-founders. Alexandra, who has combined great management skills and data science experience, and Igor, who is also an extremely smart researcher. Apart from them, we have three people in research and development, marketing, marketing specialist, and designer. In total, we have eight people and growing. I will be happy to answer your questions, and if you have any questions later, feel free to reach out to us via email on the slide. Okay, that's it. Um, thanks very much. I thought, it was... Craig, you there? Because obviously we saw this last week, didn't we? Yeah, um, I thought that was we much did. better. I would, think, I would say so, yeah. You've taken, taken lots of things on board, um, which was good. Um, w one thing that I would like to see um, is when it comes to a customer acquisition, I, I know you've added the You've added what the, the aspects that you're going to do via social media, media etc. Yeah. Et I would like to try and see some some figures in there for what the spend should equate to, and then uh, try to try to try to get it to. If you can start to determine what a per customer acquisition cost will be, then then you're really mm -hmm. drilling down into those numbers. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So it's difficult, and I appreciate it's difficult to do that. 
but that would be the that would be the next step on for, for what you've done since last week. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 price per customer is like we actually have it. I didn't put it on site. Uh, I will uh, I will definitely do that. Um, I guess my question is so. Um, the deck that I pre present to you, right? It it seems like at least for me, it seems to uh, be more on the long deck side rather than short deck side, right? Uh, because there are, there are twenty slides in in there. Mm. Uh, so my question is, do you think there was something that probably I could cut cut out uh, out of it for a short deck version? something that was not that necessary to show in the first place. And can you just flick uh, through the pages again? So yeah. Have a look. yeah, sure. So, the title, problem. I think this, just go back to the other oh, video. Is it possible to do a, I mean, you've got the animation in there and that. Is it possible to sort of show it in not real life but actually what you're doing at the moment you know how it would work um, so what you mean is uh, focus for example uh, like like show, showing more of like maybe sound so at the moment also we've got right. you with Bowie and then yeah would it so obviously it, like I don't know, put some sound in there. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Right, because obviously now with with, with everybody I'm being online and meetings, really it, it, it might be advantageous to put in, because you're obviously, you know, that that's your model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it might be good to present it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Or even, sure. the, even the app. Mm-hmm. To what degree yeah. you've got at the moment, because that's showing investors what they're looking. At. I mean, I can understand this, but it, I think if you can physically see it and you pop it in, it might be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm, you know, you're mm -hmm. selling an idea here, and then yeah. that, that that would work. Um, yeah. I think yeah, you, okay. you know your, your timing was around five, just over five minutes. So again, it's not it's not a huge issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And you've got a bit okay. of graphics yeah. in there anyway, so people look at pictures and things. So quite like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. One one more um one more point. If you just go to the if you go to the last slide um with the, the co founders and the, the team, sorry, I don't know if it's the very last slide. Yeah. This um this team is a uh, is you've got quite a young team. Okay. And they're all they all look young in those photos as well. So I know it's not um necessarily a business attire um, scenario, but I, I just don't know if the, if the functionality of the photographs that are in there represents the experience that you've you've, you've got. Because, because you're young, those pictures to me seem like you are young, right? So huh. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't reflect the, the, uh, the input okay. that's into the, into the business so far as my... Um, estimation sometimes some investors like to see some gray hair in there mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. as an ad mm -hmm. advisory board type thing or whatever i'm not telling you to to appoint someone on your team that you don't know or anything along those lines but this mm -hmm. particular slide here gives us the impression it's a really young team and that's that's not to that's not to everyone's liking and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it there's not there's nothing wrong with it but i'm just just as an observation. Perhaps. Yeah. So actually, would it be better if uh, you know instead of uh, photos, we rather would you know just uh, put more credentials of people because uh, you, can do, you can do a short bio. No, you don't yeah. have to read any. You don't have to read everybody's bio out when you're doing your presentation. Yeah, people yeah, can yeah. read that in their own their own time. Um, mm -hmm. But if I if I was you, I would I would um, I would have the the guys um, with with a slight bio and making it look like uh, 
mm-hmm. more, business, oh, yeah. more, more business attire in the pictures as well. Yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah, I can, look. I. It's two sides to this. Um, it's a tech thing. It's a young. You know, you. I suppose your market. I know exactly what Craig's saying, and he's right. But um, you can go both ways. That's what I'm saying. Some. I'm swear I'm I, saying some. There's nothing wrong with it, but some investors like to see it the other side. So. By that token, is it, is it best to do it? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what I'd, well, I'd, if, again, I wouldn't get too bogged down in talking about the team at this stage anyway, because it's, but what I would do, if you're going to put those up, then um, I'd look at, obviously, you're putting the names in there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then having a link when, not for this pitch, but for when it's sent out to people that links in to say they're, or, or links to their LinkedIn profile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure. But that way, then they can look at it themselves. So when when the when the deck's sent out, yeah, mm-hmm. um, you click on it, then it takes you to whoever it is profile on LinkedIn, so they can yeah. potentially yes. ask us to check them out. Yeah. So sure. don't. What I'm saying is, don't fill up too much on you know, on the founder's side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask a question? Is that allowed or? Yeah, of course you can. Cool. Um, <clears throat> just, just on kind of my, my kind of, um, w- one of the questions that's going on in my head is how is this type of idea defendable in the scenario that it's successful? So um, when you build the app, one yeah. of two scenarios will happen. People will, either really want to use it and it will become really big um, or they won't. They right. don't, it kind of doesn't matter if you've got any way of defending it, but in the scenario that it becomes very successful, um, we're obviously going to anticipate that people are going to try and copy this and, and create a version that may be free and has a different type of model or a cheaper price or some sort of technology giant wants to try and replicate it for their own platforms. Is there anything that you've got that can provide reassurance to an investor in the event that this idea becomes really big, that there's a way of defending against other people encroaching on that, that value that you've created. I think that's an excellent question, Richard. Um, my comment there, again, uh, one of the things we do in our workshops, and, and I think I've been on, we, we talk about IPs and trademark lawyers and such like, attorneys. Um, is there something or have you, first of all, have you spoken to any IP lawyers about protecting patents or, or such like within the, um, yeah, within so, the app? I know there's an issue somewhere, depending on where you are, regarding algorithms against, um, I don't think you can patent an algorithm, but you can patent what the product with that algorithm, and it does. But uh, as I say, I'm not an IP lawyer. Um, have you yeah. spoken to so I guess um, I, I, uh, I actually I will use that I will use that opportunity to ask uh, my own question, right? So uh, as far as I researched uh, the the creation, right, the the making of like patent, for example, takes up to five years. So and. Uh, if that's the case, right? So uh, the creation uh, of patents will uh, take some so much time that uh, I mean it's uh, it, 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 it it's almost doesn't make sense to to wait five years for that. Uh, or uh, is there any other more quicker ways to, uh, to, to, to to get some protection? Because and I know that that like uh, at least I, I read that that in the UK this process is is extremely is extremely long. It, it takes several years for people to, to to get some sort of protection. I think my advice to you, Ivan, here and also to Richard's comment, uh, personally, and I think what Richard's getting to, I wouldn't invest on the basis that there's no protection. Mm-hmm. Somebody mm-hmm. could just get in there, copy your idea, as Richard said, copy your idea, offer it. Mm-hmm. out there for you know for free mm-hmm. could, could control it more on the data side yeah um it, it's something that when anybody's looking at getting investment ready and raising money they they've got to look at um 
Now, uh, with the um, sorry, foresters who are our partners on, on the IP attorneys in London, they have an office in Munich as well. I think. I think. Sorry, you're in. You, did you mention last time you're in Germany? Yeah, I'm in Germany. Yeah, they've got an office in Munich anyway. Uh, the point is, I can. You, they'll give you a thirty-minute free um, consultation over the Zoom nowadays, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah, can tell them perfect. what you're doing, and then get some advice. For, you know, literally for free. Obviously, then if it's something that you can do and you can pattern and you can, you know, moving forward, that it adds immense value to your proposition. I have investors who will only look at companies that have got some form of IP. Yeah, no matter what they're doing. Right? but that's all they'll look at um, and when you're going out to the marketplace and talking to serious investors about something like this um, which doesn't have any protection then i think it's going to be difficult mm -hmm. right? yeah so for, so for the sake of a 30-minute conversation that isn't going to cost you anything mm -hmm. um, yeah perfect that's who i get hold of foresters um do you have her details um, I'll send you. A... Oh, it's not Isabella. Who is it? Oh, we get Dan. I'll tell you what I do. I mean, I'll, I'll email you the details later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will uh, write to Dan about it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Richard. Did, are you okay with all with that as well? Yeah, yeah. That was um, that was in, in an interesting answer. It, it's kind of I would echo that in terms of any sophisticated investor is going to evaluate, not just based on do I think it's a good idea, but can it be protected? Can there be value built up in that business? Um, and I suppose really your answers are either yes, we can protect against it, in which case this is answering that question. Essentially, that was an unanswered, unanswered question in my mind that I think other people are likely to also have as an unanswered question during your presentation. So it might be worth just addressing that because your options are, yes, we can protect it and this is what we're doing to protect it, even if that's just around copyright or stuff to do with the software that you've got, or mm -hmm. no, we can't protect it. So we're going to go as quickly as possible in the hope that somebody else decides to buy us and adopt our user base and our technology rather than trying to replicate us. But, but those would be the kind of directions I would imagine um, more, more viable for you. But yeah, that would be my kind of input on that. But um, yeah, it sounds like an interesting idea. Uh, thank you. That was very valuable inputs. I mean, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll send you that out later. Um, if anybody else wants details on foresters um, or see legals, just put it in chat and I'll send them out to you. Um, now, um, uh, Fazana, I, I am wondering what SL stands for and also this workshop is free tonight. What's, sorry, are you there Fazana? Can we have a chat? I don't quite understand your, um, your question. I think she might mean SEIS. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Assam, are you there, sir? Yes. Hello. Right. Uh, Hi. How are you? Yeah. I'll let you, I'll just, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I should be able to. Uh, okay. I'll let you carry on. Uh, let me just over here. Hello, it's me here now. Hi, yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, to do, let me just find where the files are. Hmm. I've never done this on this one before. Let me just open the file first. I do apologize unless somebody else is uh, prepared to go ahead with this. Uh, I do apologize.
PowerPoint. Oh, it's loading now. Oh, yes. Can you see my screen? Not me. Uh, yes, now. Okay, that's great. Cool. Uh, my name is Asim. Uh, um, uh, we are starting uh, uh, Presto Money. Uh, it's a one stop solution to offer multiple on demand services. Uh, Amazon of local products and services. So, what I mean by is uh, uh, a unified marketplace where local businesses can uh, sell their products through this platform. Uh, very similar to Just Eat, but Just Eat is just purely focused on uh, 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 growth uh, on the food uh, business, whereas we are focusing on other apart except food. Yeah, so that's where we are working on. So it's a unified marketplace. Uh, due to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it increases the need for on-demand delivery services. Uh, and uh, especially a lot of people are struggling with the grocery shopping and a lot of businesses are uh, impacted uh, because of COVID-19. A lot of businesses are closed. So what we are actually doing is providing them a platform where they can uh, offer click and collect or delivery service. So delivery services, either we manage it on their behalf or they can manage the delivery services themselves. So, and our, the first very niche is uh, grocery services, uh, grocery uh, convenience stores, but we will be looking into any other market as well. So if there's a, uh, if you're looking for a, a spa treatment or uh, are looking for a cleaners, so we are actually making a unified, so all the businesses will be there. So again, the biggest problem, uh, what people are facing these days is multiple niche markets, as we have seen uh, that the more and more marketplaces are appearing, there's Justy, Deliveroo, there is Helping, there's Justy. So now people have to have multiple accounts to log into these places and to buy things there. Yeah, so what we are doing is combining and making one marketplace where you can, you'll be able to find everything in one place. So difficult to uh, buy online, uh, online from the local businesses. And this is the biggest challenge. A lot of local businesses, they don't have online presence as small businesses, either they can't afford it or they don't have the resources to manage the online platform. Uh, another thing is uh, we're offering uh, the finance solution, but that's gonna happen at later stages. So this is quite similar to payday loan. People want to buy something or if somebody's car is broken and they want to fix it, but uh, uh, when they go, uh, for the repair, then there is no other option for them. So what we're going to do work with the uh, uh, different, uh, if somebody is looking for appliances or if somebody wants to uh, have a problem with their car and they, they have a bill of like eight, 900 pounds, so we can arrange uh, interest-free finance for them. Yeah. So we're going to make money from the, uh, uh, the commission of it. Uh, another thing is the cashless payments and uh, paper receipts. So this is another uh, biggest challenge for Generation Z, they, uh, they don't carry cash. And now, especially with COVID-19, things have changed anyway. Till when we were working on this proposition at that time, 50% was 50% uh, of the transactions were cash. But I think that has shifted towards more, I think probably 80, 90% now is cashless. Uh, but we're also uh, providing a, a tool for that. So who will be using this? Uh, it's the retailers, grocery stores, salons, freelancers, contractors, taxi driver, therapist. So these are the niche market and who's the buyer is generation Y and Z mainly uh, looking for university and college students. So that's our key uh, or casual worker. So these are the niche market who will be using this. Uh, Unique proposition. So what we are doing is creating a unified marketplace. So I can just quickly play a video. I don't know if that's going to work right now in Zoom. I might skip this video. I think it's gonna, on the Zoom probably is not gonna be a best to run it. Oh, have I stopped the screen share? 
Yes. Yes, I think uh, I was trying to close the web page and then just. So again, we have developed a unified marketplace for mobile world, putting the user first, connecting online and offline retailers and service providers through smartphone technology and connecting uh, and creating a cashless uh, payment ecosystem. Uh, so I'll further go down again who we are and why we are doing at this stage we've currently we believe that there is a market gap uh, a unified marketplace has been uh, uh, quite big in the uh, far east especially indonesia uh, uh, china uh, and those kind of countries yeah where you, you, there is also there is already a, a grab go grab and go jerk and those kind of apps being already available so in uk uh, there is a big gap for unified marketplace so that's where we are working on uh, and again who the team is i'm the founder i have uh, experience in fintech space so i work in a banking and i spend a lot of time in payment and the uh, retail stores as well we own a uh, couple of restaurants uh, again uh, 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 one of the advisors uh, he's a co-founder of and ceo of raisin so he's advising us uh, in terms of uh, the product development and giving us some heads up on things. Uh, uh, Tepesa Maslam, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, he's also worked in the retail sector and he has a good understanding of different kinds of businesses and, uh, and helping me build and develop this product. And then we have a chartered accountant who's looking after all the finances side of things and looking into and how we can make sure that we are more cost effective when we go into the market. Uh, the market opportunity there is uh, is a huge uh, market. Uh, just a food delivery service by 2023, it'll be 25 billion uh, addressable market size. Because we are looking to unified marketplace, so there is so many products we can sell. So the market itself is huge. Uh, another opportunity is the the platform and the payment integration we have done. It helps us to scale into. Uh, 32 uh, uh, other countries, European and non-European countries, and we're also providing an ecosystem for dark stores. Yeah, so this will help uh, 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 any small businesses who's currently, uh, especially with COVID-19, rather than opening a main store, they can actually have a dark store. So quite similar to Amazon, where you don't need to have to have a store, you can still have a shop and you can sell to businesses. But this is just purely for the local businesses. Yeah. We are ready to launch. We have developed that app uh, is, and we will be launching in about two weeks time. So probably it'll be end of June or early July, we'll be launching in Milton Keynes. Uh, that's where uh, our key focus is. And later on, we're gonna expand into the other geographical locations. So this is how it works. So it's uh, the main uh, app where you can find different businesses. You look at the products, you buy the products. Uh, another key feature we are working on is the payment system. Uh, even though we are working on a QR technology, it, it, uh, it is very old, uh, been in the Far East for a long time, but due to pandemic, this is the right time to actually launch and bring this technology where uh, the taxi drivers and those kind of gig economy workers uh, currently struggling to accept payments, we are offering them a tool where with a few clicks, they can open an account and they can start accepting payments. So they, do, they, they don't need to have any kind of uh, uh, card reader or anything else like that. So they can accept payments without card reader and don't have to go take too long to actually sign up for an account. Uh, the person who will be making a payment, they simply just scan a QR code, enter that amount, and then uh, uh, the payment will go through. And it also, uh, or as a, as a uh, consumer you can have multiple cards so very similar to like a curve so it's uh, uh, when you're making a payment you can decide which card you want to use to make a payment and all the receipts and everything will be in one place so actually we are empowering users to actually decide how the money will be or uh, how they would like to make a payment rather than other way where the merchant is accept, uh, requesting a payment here actually consumer is initiating the payment themselves uh, so this is the solution itself. Uh, currently, we are working with debit cards, but our, uh, going forward, we will be integrating PSD2 open banking, Google Pay and Apple Pay into our app and uh, interest-free uh, uh, financing. That's gonna happen later stages. Uh, how, uh, so that's the app. And then again, people will be making payments in store and on the web. 
use cases people will use in store people will use it as pre-ordering food self-service the checkouts order grocery pay for the taxi uh, book cleaners and pay for them book spa treatments you name it basically you'll have all kind of services on there uh, i think these are the benefits 24-hour shop for retailers uh, sales forecasting we will be able to using ai and ml will be able to predict their future sales forecast and help them to manage their human resources inventory uh, improve their cash flow uh, and uh, without signing up for any uh, uh, card readers or anything uh, increase productivity so because we can do uh, we can uh, help them with sales forecast so it will actually faster checkouts and reduced uh, queue sizes for their businesses and uh, channel will be focusing more on the PR side of things initially uh, around Milton Keynes they're going cashless and helping businesses uh, in COVID-19 situation as well uh, and the next, next campaign will be around social media uh, word of mouth and university and canteen so that's going to be later stages so our key focus will be in these three first three channels uh, I think these are revenue projections. We are planning to raise 250K. Uh, main, most of the money will be going into marketing and human resources, so i.e. Uh, growing the team. Uh, infrastructure and development cost is very low. Uh, we've already developed the platform, uh, the application, but we will be continuously making some improvements to it. Uh, these are the key metrics. How are we gonna check? I think uh, I'll skip these two. Uh, slides. Uh, I think, yeah, that's it. Azam, thanks very much for that. Um, quick initial question that I ask everybody Do you have any SCIS or EIS advanced assurance? Uh, we are actually applying for it, and okay. uh, we, uh, we've already working with Seed Legal. Legal. Okay, fine. Uh, everything is in process. I think we just need to submit our application to HMRC to get it. Uh, so we are looking for uh, SEIS and EIS both. Uh, we will be applying for both. Okay. Um, I put that uh, either as a line saying SCIS, EIS, advanced assurance being applied for or when you put initially, and then when you've got it, just change it to SEIS, EIS, advanced assurance. Yeah. Craig, have you got any comments or anybody else want to? Um... There was a there was a lot of information to take in there, wasn't there? Yeah. Um, just the, the one, the one, the one of the important ones is, is the slide that you skipped over, um, which was the revenue and how you were going to generate that. Could you could you flick back onto that slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I did skip through it. Uh, to be honest with you, I think one thing that I've realized after doing this uh, 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 workshop that I'm not very much prepared yet. So I, I need to focus more on the structure of it because I had a lot oh, of information and I've just uh, gone too much into other that's, things. Yeah? That's, what, that's what this is for. So yes, don't, don't, so don't it was worry. a good exercise for don't me. Uh, yeah. Revenue, uh, okay. Uh, First of all, the question is why uh, these other companies, uh, businesses will come to us. Yeah? I mean, if you look at the Just Eat and Deliveroo's and those kind of businesses, they are taking up to 30% of the business revenues, yeah? uh, especially like uh, a restaurant takeaway and Deliveroo's and Just Eat, they take about 30%. So what we're offering is 6% per sale. So we're gonna really reduce the, rev uh, uh, the commission for the businesses. So that's our first revenue generator, which is 6% uh, on the transactions. Uh, another thing which we will be doing is we are actually building a payment ecosystem, which I mentioned about the QR code. Uh, on the QR code, we will be charging point. We'll be making 0.5% commission on top of what we are paying to our suppliers. <coughs> so, uh, if you look at the market currently, uh, uh, Square, uh, 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 Square, and uh, Sum Up, they normally charge 1.9%. Uh, per commission plus 20p transaction. So we will be charging roughly about same 1.9% uh, uh, 
plus 20p per transaction. And that's the only money they have to pay. So we will be making 0.5% from that revenue. So we have two revenues. One is 6% on the uh, platform. If, some, if we sell something for our uh, merchants and then 0.5% on the payment side of things. <clears throat> See, a lot of important information um, in what you've just said there, which which isn't in any of those slides. Um, for me, I would like to know that Just Eat and Deliveroo is, is who you're trying to capture market share from, what their current costs are and how you're going to solve an expensive problem for, for the retailers. Um, and then obviously you, you, your payment gateway or your, or your payment solutions is, is, a, is another trick up your sleeve. People need to know who, who you're going against and what, what sort of uh, market you're trying to capture from them. Um, so that I would suggest that in your next incarnation of this um, slides um, that you, you try to incorporate that and, 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 and name drop some of those names and maybe even have some visuals in there. Um, in, income versus burn rate is really important. Not everyone puts that in. As an investor, that's, that's certainly what you want to see. Um, so that's that's a slide that makes a lot of sense. So I would um, I would make sure that this is incorporated, and then I'd try and fine tune some of the other slides down that where there was too much information in the process um, versus versus some of the essential ones here. Okay, we are pre-revenue, uh, but as I mentioned, we will be going live in about two weeks' time. Uh, we are just doing some final testing. We are making the live website, and we are pu publishing our app to. Uh, Apple and Google Store. So hopefully sure. by the end of this month we will be up and running uh, in Milton Keynes area. So we're yeah. doing some marketing strategy we are currently working on. Uh, I know from the investors point of view they want to see some traction especially when it's something to do with like a marketplace because it's, it is very competitive and what we are actually working on is very different kind of marketplace solution. Uh, so yes. Uh, as soon as some of the most successful businesses are still not making money, right? Some of the biggest valuations are still burning yeah. cash. So there's nothing, you know, in this, this day and age, it's, it's flipped on its head. So that's not something to, to shy away from. You yeah. just have to be able to show the, like you said, the, the growth pattern of the company. Um, so people can back your, back your process. We, yes, I mean, again, uh, we, uh, we are working on a very different proposition compared to Deliveroo. They're even charging 30%. And even last year, there were 3 million in loss after making 40, mil, uh, 40 million, but they were still in loss by 3 million because they have a very high delivery cost. We don't want to enter into a delivery business, especially for the food delivery. We will be going into delivery logistics but non-food item, non-hot food items, I would say. So if somebody asks a request for a delivery for grocery, yes, because we can manage multiple deliveries in one slot. And this way, how we can be very cost effective. Whereas their model is hot food, you have to deliver it within 15 to 20 minutes. And that's where they have a very big cost. And that's where we are actually, we have a very different logistic model. I got a question if it's okay. Yep, that's fine. Yep. Um, so, you know, I mean, and this is not only in the, just your pitch, but also like a lot of the pitches that I've seen on here, you know, it's like when you're doing something like a project like going up against Amazon, you know, um, how do you expect to really not lose? A few years. I mean, a lot of these tech companies, they have just a, a massive burn rate, you know, they, the first five years, I mean, they're just big time, you know what I mean? It's like, they're not even like supposed to be kind of breaking or any kind of things like that, you, you know, and I mean, this goes for just about every pitch I've seen on here, you know, it's like, people that expect to like just uh, there's too much noise. I can't hear you at the moment properly. Yes, I, I think it's better now. Is so, no, 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 I think it's better now. Uh, yeah, it's clear now. Mic is giving off that noise. I don't think it's my mic. 
No, 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 it's not. Uh, so is your question that there's big companies like Amazon and there's so many other big players in the market who have a lot of revenue, I mean, a lot of capital, and they can enter into this market space or they struggle to capture the market? No, no. I mean, my question was like that you plan to compete on the marketplace space. Yeah. That's like basically against Amazon. Yeah. What, why do you think you're going to break even so quickly? And I mean, it's like I said, it's a question yeah. for just about every pitch on, on yes. there. Like every, uh, everyone thinks they're going to break even in a year. It's like, I don't understand why they, how does that work? Yes. I mean, uh, the first thing is we actually just, uh, the way we look at it, uh, even though our profit uh, uh, commission rates are very low, uh, and we are working with just our main focus is in local market and local businesses. There is no competition in that here at, the, at this stage, unless Deliveroo and Just Eat jump into the market. If they do, they have to change all their business model <clears throat> because even at this stage, they're not profitable. Yeah. Uh, what the way we are actually working on, we actually trying to reduce the cost. We're not going into the delivery. If we are doing the delivery, we are managing the delivery. So we have a revenue from the delivery, which is not even mentioned there. What we're going to focus is just a platform. Once the service is there, we're not going to have too much overheads. That's the thing which we've been working on, trying to reduce our overheads, <coughs> is uh, to get into the market with very minimum cost, running cost for our business. The more running cost we have, I think the biggest challenge people, businesses face, they spend a lot of money on advertisement, and which is the challenge. Even just recently, uh, a lot of businesses are sending offer, uh, offers. and the way we are actually wanted to, what our the vision is, that we're providing the service so cheap, is our merchants will be promoting our business. So if they are paying 30% to deliver, and we're only charging 6%, it's in their interest to actually promote us and get the order from our service. Uh, and Yes, I understand your questions, but this is how we think that makes makes us different from our competitors and and break even within the first year. I mean, again, another thing is uh, I have slightly in more detail, uh, which is based on the model, which is from Y uh, Incubator that you need to have. If if you're a successful startup, you need to have five uh, percent. Uh, week on week growth. And based on the model, we worked on the figures that we started taking, uh, we are getting merchants on board every, uh, new merchants every week, and then the number of transactions, uh, and then from the transaction, if we are taking the small percentage. We are actually, especially with COVID-19 situation, we can, if we play our cards right, we can actually bring a lot of business towards this platform and that's where it will increase the revenue. I mean, just, a, a, just for a small store, a grocery store, average turning, uh, that's, I'm talking about a corner, uh, corner shop here. Yeah? Their monthly uh, sales on average is about 10 to 20 K. That's a very small store and 20 K revenue. If that start going through our platform, not even all, all of it, but half of it, we can still, convert 10k of 6% that gives us some revenue. I mean, yeah, so so just uh, very quickly, my piece of advice on it would be, you're, it sounds as if you're trying to spread yourself across far too many markets, all from the start, and, yeah. um, and hoping that the fact that you're cheaper than some competitors will mean that people will flock to you. I would be skeptical about those points to how quickly people will um, migrate to you because you're cheaper. It sounds a bit like uh, I'm going to be an eBay, but I'll be half the price, and therefore yeah. everybody's going to start listing their their products on my platform, and then I won't have to do any marketing, and it'll become this big business. I think you're probably off better off picking a, a few niche markets that are easy to manage in terms of deliveries, that are uh, low cost in terms of you can have one person pick up ten orders and then be able to go and deliver them in a time efficient and fuel efficient route um, and really get to the, the, the problem that a prospect is having um, rather than trying to become, essentially try and become an Amazon 
in the way that Amazon started by picking books and DVDs, as opposed to trying and starting an Amazon based on Amazon's current business model in all different types of markets. Uh, I would suggest picking a few niche markets, really drilling into those and becoming a place that people talk about, about how they can get the product in that particular niche delivered to them. Um, particularly if you're going to do delivery as well, because there's a lot of costs involved in, in doing that. Yeah. And you've got to realistically expect, anticipate some competition from Just Eat and Deliveroo and all these other Uber Eats, people who've already got infrastructure in place and that actually to put a product in the in the back of their car and deliver it en route isn't really going to be that much of a problem for them. So they're only really missing the front end, which is people actually going on to their shop and buying it through their platform, which again, they're going to have lots of different uh, experts in their business to be able to do. So anticipate competition and get, treat that with a little bit more um, as, if it, as if you're already in that battle, even though that, that competitor hasn't um, shown themselves yet. Um, because if you do get any traction, there will be competition and they have yeah. a lot of deep pockets that will, that will spend on money to try and acquire your customers. So um, yes. that would be my feedback on it. But I wish you well with it. Hope it yeah. goes well. I think your point is very valid uh, about, uh, and again, that's the reason I've uh, uh, taken your feedback on board. We are not going to focus on the food, uh, on the food delivery business because that market is already very saturated. I mean, again, we have delivery, just eat, uh, and uh, 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 Uber Eats. Uh, the, our prime first prime focus will be on the grocery stores. <clears throat> Why grocery stores? We can actually compete. And again, that's where the percentage. And we are starting with very small in a Milton Keynes area. If we are successful in Milton Keynes, that's the only time we're going to grow out from the grocery and uh, any uh, small other shops, the retail shops who don't currently have a platform to sell things. We're going to bring them on board. There's no cost to them to come on board. They can just put their products and if things, if they, if they sell, we'll take the commission. So our, another, what we're going to focus on helping people with click and collect that reduces our cost that reduces their cost. That actually helps them in a way that they don't have. Sorry, but isn't, isn't, isn't click and collect just, it, there's a corner shop down the road. Yeah. Isn't click and collect me just going to the corner shop and buying it and picking it up? I mean, yes. that's, isn't that yes. pretty much what a corner shop does already? It is. It is very much similar, but due to this current situation, I mean, again, this is not our key proposition was that current situation, the COVID-19, but currently I think a lot of businesses have to put these measure, measure, uh, social distancing measures in place. And again, long queues, sometimes you have to go in there, but if your food is already, uh, your grocery or some items is already ready to collect, you know what is available locally. So you can find a business, you can order a product, and now you have an option. Either you just go and grab it, when the product is ready for you to collect because you'll get a not notification or you can get it delivered. If you want to get it delivered, you will pay slightly more for it. How much does it cost for delivery? Uh, delivery, we are uh, saying three pounds for the delivery. I mean, oh. again, just, I mean, again, delivery charge is four pounds and they are taking 30% commission from the merchant as well. So, and again, the delivery cost is slightly higher and this way we are actually promoting click and collect for some people. They might think, do you know what, three pounds, I'd rather just go and collect it myself. But as long as things are ready for me, I don't have to shop. I do, because there are some people that are nervous as well. With, they don't want to go into shop and don't want to be very close with so, so many other people as well. It's ideal for them. And people who are like elder, I mean, anyone over 60, probably for them will be a good tool as well because we're launching a mobile app and the website as well. So once they have done the shopping from any store, they can, next time they just one click, they can reorder everything. Okay, Adam, thanks very much for that. What, one point I might make here quickly, I don't normally say this, I'd make this slide or this deck longer. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's got quite a lot of information in it, and then look at rejigging a five to eight slide one, where you're picking out the key, yes. the key points as initial sales. Yeah, so yeah. keeping it simple just to attract interest. Expanding I, this one to then show additional information. 
he, yes, after to be honest, after going through this with uh, on this uh, session, I've realized myself that there is too much in there. Whereas I need to simplify it. The message should be very simple, uh, which is what I've discussed afterwards. I think that should be a presentation rather than the those kind of things. Yes, yeah, so I've real. Uh, yeah, I, I have picked up your point. I think you're very right. There's too much information. I need to skim it down to very basic, and that's what I need to be focusing on. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can you just stop sharing your screen for us? That'd be great. Yeah. Thanks. Fine. Thank you. Um, now we've got a couple of people come in. Um, Andreas, hi. I'll put you on the next if I can. Um, is it? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, great. Um, oops, Microsoft Store. Where does that come from? Okay, sorry. Um, let me just stop my mic and I'll let you carry on. You, you joined yeah. earlier. Uh, I've got Craig Martin, who's my business partner. He's online. Um, okay. Andreas Craig's going to be presenting tonight with Store Card. So um, I'll let you guys chat later, but um, I'll shut up for now. And, and can Andreas, I, if you want to yeah, share, share my screen, screen? Yeah. you should be able to, yeah. All right, this is my first Zoom presentation, so let's see if this works. Okay. Can, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, yeah. no problems. It, okay, let's go there. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Andres. I'm CEO and co-founder of Storecard. You know, they, they say raising a family is the, is the toughest job you'll ever love. And, and it's true. It can be lots of fun, but it's also costly and, and quite demanding. And before having kids, my wife and I considered ourselves financially savvy people. But that confidence and that sense of control flew out the window when we became parents. And it hasn't really come back. It seems like the moment we put out one costly fire, another one is you know, looming out on the, on the horizon. And we get so caught up in the moments that we never really fully appreciate how raising a family really is a lifelong and multi-generational journey. We seem to always be on the back foot. And first it was with baby costs and childcare. Then it was uh, school costs and holiday clubs. And soon it will be university fees and, and elderly care for our own parents. And with COVID and the looming recession, life is gonna get even more difficult and complicated. So we really need to get smarter about our finances, but we're also gonna need a little bit more help and guidance from, from our uh, family and friends. So raising a family might be the toughest job you'll ever love, but we think that it can certainly be made a lot easier cheaper and better for all of us moms and dads. And that's really where Storecard comes in. So we're building the first life stage financial platform that helps parents make better decisions by using data to anticipate their upcoming needs, but by also making it easier for their family and friends to offer support. We're building Storecard to be the go-to resource for parents looking to find and share the information, connections, and services they need to make the best financial decisions for their family. Unlike other fintech and parent tech offerings, we leverage both predictive data and personal networks to help parents make smarter, more effective decisions. The data On the data side, our data gives us deep understanding of the unique financial needs of parents and allows us to predict how those needs will change over time. The social design of our platform makes it easier for parents to mobilize and coordinate all the support and goodwill they have from their friends and family. We don't see ourselves replacing banks because we serve a completely different focus. We focus on better decision making. So we use data and communities to find relevant information <coughs> and access personalized products. We have recently gone to market with our first product, an innovative joint account that is especially designed for new parents. The account is built around the village feature, a place where parents can see big upcoming costs, where they can share relevant information with their family and friends, 
and where they can access products and retail discounts that are personalized to their circumstances and preferences. We already have over 5,000 registered users and are growing at 75% on average each month. From here, our product roadmap will target the future and upcoming needs of our users as their families continue to grow. We will make it easier for parents to choose us again and again over the years because our one our village feature already is integrated with their, their um, existing support network. And two, our, user, our use of predictive data makes the decision making easier and gives them more peace of mind. I'm extremely proud of what our team has accomplished so far. We've built a platform completely in-house and we've successfully launched our first product in a highly regulated market. Given with our complementary expertise in tech, data science and finance, we have been shown that we've been able to move quickly and build effectively. To double down on the great traction that we've seen so far and further pursue our product roadmap, we're looking to raise 500,000 pounds in SEIS EIS funds. And these proceeds will mostly go towards hiring, specifically in the areas of marketing and development. So come and join us on this mission to redefine the relationship that parents have with money. Thank you. Andres, that was great. Nice, short, straight to the point. Thanks. Um, Craig, do you have any comments there? Or anybody else? Richard, I know you've been commenting, commenting a little bit. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll engage if you want. Um, sure. I think it's good. I think that you've, um, I think it's got good, good potential. The thing I like particularly about that type of business model is once you've identified a parent, you're essentially able to anticipate what they're going to need to buy along the next 16 years of that child's life, essentially. Yeah. So you know roughly when they're going to need a pram and you can present them with offers that allow you to then sell that as advertising to pram sellers or exactly earn a commission off it. So I really like that aspect of it. Um, and I think there will be other people who value access to that audience because parents are going to have disposable income and that's going to be of value to certain people. Um, I think that I, I wasn't really quite sure about the whole comparing it to a bank. That, that, that comment threw me off a little bit. I, I probably was thinking of it more of like um, a loyalty account somewhere or I, I wasn't naturally thinking, oh, this is going to be a bank for, for um, new parents. And I suppose I would probably try and maybe phrase that differently. So I'm not drawing that comparison. Um, mm. Because as soon as you said that, I'm like, actually, how much do people spend to try and convince people to switch banks? Yeah. I've just become a parent for the first time. Am I then likely to then try and get somebody to switch bank as well as handling everything? Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe phrase it differently. Maybe try and position it as being something that you can have in addition to um, yeah. uh, your normal banking needs. Um, and I think so, that sorry, just a follow up on that. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Do you have a, a is the point on even mentioning banks or the word replacing? Um, I'm not sure if you use the word replacing, but that's probably where my mind jumped to in okay. the sense that um, banks. I think Lloyd's ran an offer recently that was 150 pounds to get they would pay you to switch bank account, right? Now, if people aren't jumping on board for that type of offer, how yeah, much no. are they realistically going to jump on board for your offer just because they've become a parent? Yeah. Um, and so maybe thinking of, of having it as not as a bank, but more as an account. I'm staying in that headspace of this is something that somebody had in addition to what they normally use rather than a, a burden of having to switch over to a new provider. Um, but um, the other thing as well is you, you, you kind of talk about the social village aspect of it. Um, I probably would mention a little bit more about um, how that works in the sense that um, let's say a, a new couple have a, sorry, a couple have a, a child, they need a pram. You mentioned on what, or you saw on one of the diagrams that it said 400 pounds pram needed. Maybe signal a little bit about that, potentially around the idea that instead of people just buying them random gifts, they can see what that parent needs. And therefore that as a result of having this account, that means that people buy you stuff you actually need rather than stuff that they just assume that you want that ticks the list of, ticks that box of having bought you a gift for Christmas or birthday or whatever. So maybe that could be a use case. 
um, or point of value that's positioned with regards to the, your your offering. Um, but yeah, I think it's good. I think it's got good potential. Yeah, the the bank um, the bank comment might be uh, us uh, over responding because earlier on in our journey we were very. Um, I mean, we are kind of a parent tech, fintech kind of crossover, and we were pitching ourselves maybe a bit too much in the fintech, and people immediately went, Monzo for moms, oh, that's, uh, you know, hyper competitive. No, you, like, you're not going to build a new neobank. And we're like, well, no, no, that's not what we're, that's not what we're trying to do. So we wanted to kind of just make sure that people like explicitly say we are not becoming a bank. But it's interesting to hear your comment that say, actually, by going too far, then you're actually putting the idea into people's heads where maybe it wasn't going in that direction. But that's just me. I'm a, I might be the exception to that. So, but, but on, as a question, what is it? Is it, a, is it a credit card? Is it a debit card? Is it an actual rank account? Like what, what's the, what does it look like? So, I mean, the, the overall platform that we're building is, is, is an app uh, in terms of the, what is it actually? But in terms of the first product, uh, it's uh, a debit card that's connected to, to an app. So a, a normal joint account. So the first product is very, fintech -y. it is it is similar to uh, other joint accounts in the sense that it is a debit card and, and an app just how we differentiate ourselves is around the cost predictions it's connecting to re relevant retail discounts and it's opening up the joint account then rather than having two people like the the two parents you could bring in grandma or bring in the nanny or bring in the entire team that looks after the child to to really um make things easier in terms of all the spending that happens around the child, make things smoother and less awkward. And did you mention revenue in terms of actually where you make money? I'm not sure. If uh, we didn't. Uh, so that was one of the things that I was, I, I cut in terms of the time limit, but um, the revenue model for, for the first product is very much taking a skim off of the, the retail discounts that, that we pass on. And then going forward, it's taking uh, the either, it depends on the product, but it, the next product is a, an ISA. So it's the account fee, uh, the annual fee on, on the balance held. And then if we go into financing, then it's obviously uh, either the arrangement fee or, or interest if we decide to go direct lending, um, th those kind, that, that kind of path. Cool. Richard, thanks for your comments. They're great. We need to talk, to, well, I'll talk to you separately about attending some other events because uh, the feedback's great. Uh, Andres, just a quick question. Can you go back uh, to the, the ask slide or, or just answer my question perhaps? The, right, so you're looking for 500 grand. What, um, uh, what were you offering, for want of a better word? So I go, okay, fine, there's 500K. What do I get? Uh, in terms of the percentage? I Correct, still... yeah. Yeah, so we're looking at a 14% uh, uh, stake for that. So that's a, a right, roughly around a three million free money. Okay. Uh, the fifty k in revenues by mid twenty one is that monthly or is that just a? Uh, so that is um, the no, that is uh, year to date mid. So that's okay, like six months. Yeah. All right, no problems at all. Right. Well, I, Craig, have you got any? Questions for Andreas ahead of tonight? No, Richard, um, Richard covered a lot of them. One, one of the points that, um, that wasn't covered was the 5,000 active users that you have just now. Yep. How many, how many where, as that scales up, what, did, what, does that, what will that equate to in revenue? And I know you, you, you chose not to put the revenue slide in, but obviously 5,000 active users, what does 10,000 do, 15,000 do, and how does it equate to to the milestones that you're trying to achieve. Mm, yeah, um, I mean, we have a financial, I don't have the, uh, sure. the figures mm -hmm. to, to head, but we do have a, in our longer pitch deck, we have, have a financial projection slide that has revenue and actual revenue, registered user numbers. Maybe maybe it's worthwhile to to, to put that in. I mean, you, you can- uh, uh, Sorry, I didn't check there. I, I wouldn't put that in at the moment, just- it, oh, okay. The purpose, the purpose of this one, and I, and I think that pitch is great, and I like the idea, and I want to talk. I've got a couple of people who, who would look at this. Um, anyway, well, I guess, so we, I guess we, the ask, the ask has the information. So you yeah. know, putting fifty k brings increases the registered account users to forty k, uh, and then we're producing fifty k at, at that at that moment point in time. Okay, that's great. 
Right. Any, and then anything else? Can, yeah. Compared to the one pound fifty acquisition cost. No, that that's fine. I think that's that, that's great. Um, if you can just stop sharing the presentation screen now, perfect. And, and, and Neil, sorry, uh, just um, uh, ahead of the event, do you, will you have a kind of schedule when, like, at what time different event or different people? Are <laughs> we <laughs> we norm we normally do. Um, at the moment, we've got about five or six companies. It's going to be a slightly different event tonight. What we normally do is, well, we're going to cut you off. We're not cut you off, but we're going to, um, you know, stick to the sort of five minute concept. But I want to encourage a lot more um, feedback or whatever feedback we can get, a little bit like Richard today and, and Craig um, from the from the audience. Um, okay. Because I think, you know, then that gives you the opportunity to interact, as I say, at the workshop the other week, um, and so no, no the, the pitch event we did the other week um we had a couple of guys who i know are investors on board and they were um they were already emailing and contacting the guys like you now pitching at, at this event which isn't an actual pitch event it's a practice event with a view of having some investors for them mm. yeah so um i'd like to make it a little bit more like that tonight okay. but i say craig's holding this one because i'm doing another one but uh, ah, sorry, actually, <laughs> it's uh yeah. And again, with, with to everybody here with our pitch events, it's it, it, it's what I want it to be like now. Um, but, you know, you pitch, people then will ask questions. Then you can send them the financials and everything else. Yeah, um, yeah. I've never had anybody put their hand up at an event saying, "Right, there's fifty grand for you," but it's come the following week or whatever the case might be. So, and of course, these days with the world being as it is, people are doing business over Zoom. Mm. Yeah, um, you know they'll 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 see you. They'll get an idea of what you're doing. They then request further information. Then I have private meetings with you. You know that's that's how it's working. And I think for the future, the way it is going to work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, from a founder's perspective, I, I mean, these these kinds of events are, are are very valuable, obviously, to connect to potential fundraising, but also to get the feedback from people that might not have been able to, you know, trek across London to make an event or have, um, you know, been able to, to access it. So um, it just makes th things a lot easier. Yeah, definitely. What it also does is because as I say, Craig's in Dubai, I'm, I'm currently in the UK because I can't get out. But my, my home base is in, um, in Asia. Mm. Uh, the, uh, we, we've now got people coming from different locations uh, to say come into an event and such you know in the in, when we used to do the physical events in the city if you're in hong kong you weren't coming right yeah. <laughs> unless yeah, exactly. you're in london but nowadays they can come on um, so it's really opened up the borders for investment as well which is good news yeah quarantine has opened up the borders which just sounds so you know yeah. ironic <laughs> right yeah absolutely right i'm gonna sure. stop there uh is is it Thalanash? Oh, so I can't pronounce your name. Thalanash. Yeah, it's 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 Kalanch. So okay, well there you go. Sorry about that. I'm too, no, no, I do it's, apologize. It's our name. Okay, I'll let you carry on. Thank you so much. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Just hit the little green thing at the bottom. I don't know how you. Yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you so much for hosting this session. It's really, it's generally a pleasure to be here. I'm currently in India right now, and I don't know if it wasn't for the quarantine, I, I probably wouldn't be able to attend this session. So thank you so much for hosting this virtually as well. And I'll just get right to it. So I'm actually, my name is Talanj Patra, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Pareto Tree. And we're building diagnostic wearable medical devices to predict cardiac arrest and stroke. So I remember, it was six months ago when one of, my, one of our close friends of the entire team, he was 24 years old. He went into a tertiary care hospital in California and he had some abdominal, abdominal swelling, got a treatment, was lying in the general ward for five days. And apparently the fifth day, my friend has a cardiac arrest and he's no more, right? And that day it struck me that 
your odds, right? You're reading this, my odds. Everyone that's looking at the slide, your odds are one over three to die from a cardiovascular disease, right? That's something to be feared of. That, that scares me to be very frank with, right? On a very personal level. And let's look at, let's, let's look at India as a, in, in, the, in the healthcare market in general as well, or let's look at healthcare overall, right? And, and you'll see news articles that talk about five million, year, five million people a year dying just because of medical errors, people dying because of poor quality of care and so on, right? And one thing that we really notice in healthcare is a shift from a reactive approach all the way to a proactive approach and then in turn moving to a predictive approach, right? So a reactive approach is something very basic where you can imagine a patient has been diagnosed with something and now how do we go about really catering and treating the patient? A proactive approach is early signs might have showed up, how do we go about preventing? A predictive approach goes a step further and says, how about we predict a particular disease or a particular critical event even before the early symptoms show on, right? So you see this entire shift in the healthcare approach towards predictive rather than reactive, right? The problem that we're really solving is this, right? So if you, if you look at healthcare systems right now or hospitals in particular, there's a lack of tools to detect patient health deterioration, especially in the wards, right? There's also reduced patient mobility due to wired monitoring systems that don't really let the patient get off the bed and even go to the bathroom without, with, without the fear of not being monitored. There's also a lack of triggers for rapid response systems, right? So often rapid response systems are triggered way, triggered way later than the actual critical event. So these are problems that, that really exist in, in the market so far. And we've, we've, we've validated this, this, this problem with months of research, really trying to understand exactly the problem that's happening in the healthcare space today, especially between the hospitals. I wouldn't read all of these quotes just because it would take too much time, but nine out of 10 doctors agree that continuous monitoring of vital signs would help them better detect patient health deterioration in the wards and reduce the overall time for treatment as well. The solution, let's look at what we're developing for the problem and how do we go about solving the problem overall, right? So our solution is a hardware and a software as a service combination solution, where the hardware component is a variable vital sign monitor that, that looks exactly what's there on the slide. And, this, and it basically allows for continuous non-invasive vital signs monitoring, vital signs being heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, and a 12 lead ECG. It also allows remote monitoring from the nursing station, so a central nursing station where you can monitor every all like over 20 patients on one screen in terms of the vital signs and their stability. We also have specific alerts when patient health deterioration is detected. So that's our hardware solution. The software as a service component is basically what we call the Taru platform, right? That comes out of Tree, which is known as Taru in, in various different languages. The software as a service component, basically again, allows for remote monitoring, allows for remote alerts. And the best part, this is where really the magic happens in our solution, is the predictive analytics and personalization. So, so as, as I mentioned earlier about the shift from reactive to predictive, we're actually working towards predicting cardiac arrest and stroke four to six hours prior. And we've, re and we've achieved over 95% 90, accuracy in being able to predict the cardiac arrest six hours prior to the event and being able to alert a doctor in order to kind of cater the treatment accordingly going forward. And personalization is another concept that is, that is essential, especially in healthcare, is because if you think about it, the baselines of these vital signs is very different for different people, right? So if you're imagining a 24-year-old guy, his vital signs, his average vital signs, his average heart rate might really be roughly around 70 beats per minute. If you're thinking about a 86-year-old person, his average beats per minute might be around 80. Right? So we need, to, we need to accommodate for that and kind of set those thresholds for alerts accordingly. Our technology. So we've developed proprietary and patentable sensors in order to kind of fit everything into this one wearable device that can measure all vital signs with ICU level accuracy. We also developed proprietary and patentable denoising algorithms, right, in order to denoise the signal in terms of movement and mobility, patient mobility, and so on, in order to get accuracy. We've also further develop patentable cardiac arrest prediction and stroke prediction algorithms. Moving on, let's look at the business model, right? So the business model is simple if you think about it, it's a printer and the ink business model, where hardware is the printer, which is the wearable device, 
and it is sold on a per unit price. And the software as a service is a value-based pricing model where, for example, let's assume a hospital that, that has 200 beds and let's consider one week of one, one week time period. If in the first two days, only 10 beds were occupied, we're only charging the hospital for 10 beds. And if in the last four days, 100 beds were occupied, we're charging them for 100 beds, right? So value-based per user pricing. Something to really highlight here is that our major revenues and profits will be coming from our software as a service solution rather than the wearable hardware. Unit economics. So the Pareto monitor is roughly around $200. And, it's, and that's really the initial cost for a hospital to set up what we're setting, our vital signs monitoring system, which is over 10 folds less than current vital sign monitoring systems in terms of the initial cost. The value-based SaaS pricing, again, $30 for one bed per month. And then you can see the calculation for an annual cost of if assuming that there were 150 beds occupied in an entire month in a particular hospital. So that comes out to be $54,000. Market size. So specifically, we're focusing on the Indian market to start off just because it's a great, great environment to pilot a product and really get, get clinical validation in order to get regulatory approvals in other countries as well. And if you're looking at the Indian market as our initial target market, this is what the TAM, SOM, and SAM look like. We're looking at a $139.25 million as a market. Moving on, our competition, right? So we have a decent bit of competition in the space, to be very frank with you. And really, the things that, that separate us from the competition is cardiac arrest prediction, stroke prediction, and a SaaS business model, right? Which, which, is, which is something very new. In, in the vital sign monitoring space as well. And also there are a few other features like arterial stiffness, galvanic skin response that no other competitor is measuring that we end up measuring and giving this information to doctors, which are actually very essential for clinical decision-making for doctors as well. The other thing is reduced false alarms. This is actually one of the major problems in hospitals currently that leads to a high workload on hospital staff because it's, it's, it's known as something called alarm fatigue. Right, so there's just alarms ringing everywhere in the hospital that are saying the patient's not well. And half of these alarms, more than half of these alarms, tend to be false alarms. Right, just because the patient moved a little bit, it showed that the threshold went off, and then the alarm got triggered. Right, so we've we've developed algorithms in order to cater to that specific problem. Our go-to market strategy: a business-to-business -business model and a business-to-business -to, -business to consumer model. So we sell these wearable devices to hospitals and clinics. And hospitals and clinics pay a monthly subscription fee for our AI-driven platform. The business-to-business -to, -business to consumer model is basically for post-discharge monitoring. So if a doctor wants to measure, if a doctor wants to monitor a patient post-discharge, a patient can just lease the device from the hospital and pay a monthly subscription fee for our platform services. Our team. So I'm the CEO. Mm -hmm. Aniket is, a, is managing our entire machine learning and artificial intelligence side of the, side of our solution. Archita is managing the entire R&D department, which is basically developing these sensors, developing these algorithms, developing and collecting data and so on. And Kalyani is our hardware lead, which is really developing this wearable device and kind of micro electronic, like micro sizing it as well. And she's had the, and, and we've had a great amount of experience in various different organizations. I'm sure you recognize a few names here. Current status. So we've developed our prototypes and are now testing with end users. So we're very early stage, to be very frank with you. We've successfully built machine learning models that can predict anomalies in vital signs and predict multiple diseases using early signs and symptoms as well. We haven't yet acquired any customers. And we plan to launch our pilot with two hospitals by the end of 2020. So I apologize, there's an error in the presentation. It should be 2020 and not 2021. Milestones. The next milestones that we, and that we envision to achieve is MVP development, which will give us the right devices and the right capabilities to go in for a clinical validation. And then from the clinical validation, we move on to the regulatory approval side. So this clinical validation is a key component to regulatory approval, and that's how these three connect together. The vision. This is something that's, that, I, that I really believe in, and I think, and I, think I, I know what we're creating isn't, isn't something, isn't, isn't very big, right? It's a small solution, right? I, me and our, our entire team generally believes that this will, revolutionize how healthcare is done inside the hospital premises, right? If you, look at the, if you look at the healthcare environment, outside the hospital, there are too many solutions out there for predictive healthcare, for proactive healthcare, and so on. But inside the hospital, there isn't really much, right? And we're bringing this entire movement inside the hospital walls 
And we allow for something called open innovation, right? So we're, we're very open to researchers and innovators that have, that, have, that have created algorithms to predict various diseases and various critical events and have gotten an FDA approval. We're more than happy to have them on our platform and basically save more lives, right? Financials. We're self-financed so far. We're seeking $500,000 in investment as a SOF note. That's for around 15%. This investment would be utilized for product development and performing clinical validation. And then additional investment round would be needed for things going forward as well. COVID-19. So the COVID-19 hit, it, it did affect us quite a bit in terms of our business, in terms of our product timelines and so on. But our product can generally be used in situations like COVID-19 because you can not only monitor patients remotely with a safe distance, but also you can predict the probability of someone being infected using early symptoms like body temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and so on. Thank you so much. And it generally was a pleasure pitching to you guys. I generally love any and all feedback that you guys have for me. Here are just appendix slides of what our variable looks like and the specifications. So I'll just leave it on the specification slide. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I, let me just try and turn that on. Richard, uh, you, you've been commenting very impressively. A word of I'm looking for. Um, do you have any comments? Too much is what it's probably what we're thinking, right? Yeah, I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm all over the <laughs> but, place. Um, ho hopefully, it's okay. Hopefully, it's okay. Um, yeah, I, I like this one. Um, I I would probably phrase it differently. So. Just so people know, I, I come from a marketing and, and psychology background. I'm, I'm interested in having decisions and form beliefs and um, all that stuff, really. So if uh, I was thinking about your presentation as it went through, and one thing um, I thought of was a scenario in which your technology is being used in a, in a ward. Right, so we've, got one, we've got one nurse, we've got 20 beds, and instead of this one nurse having to go to each bed, the temperature and vital signs and all this type of stuff they can stay at their one station and they can see everything that's going on in their ward and that would be a scenario that i have essentially just imagined but probably could well happen which people would naturally go i can see how that type of technology would be of use to her uh, or him as a male nurse and also in terms of all the tracking and reporting and trying to keep up with different uh, regulatory requirements and all that type of stuff. So maybe just out with that type of scenario. Give me a scenario in which in which I kind of I, I thought of that during a presentation. Maybe just use that example so that other people get to that as a as a way of of thinking about how your products could be of value to a, to a hospital. Um, the other thing I would start off with is maybe right at the start I'm trying to get people to um, agree with a, a particular statement which is over the next 30 years or 50 years or whatever time period you want to put it, there's going to be more technology used in hospitals and as medical professionals to help track things and improve patient care. Because I think most people would agree with that if they were to think about it. And off the back of having agreed with that mentally, your, your pitch is essentially, we want to take a slice of that. We want us to capture some of that market it's available. Somebody's going to grab it. Our objective, our objective is to start here because I really liked your slide about the vision. And I potentially, I'd try and get that a little bit earlier because I think most people will agree that technology is going to be used more in healthcare, that there is an opportunity there to, to um, provide value for both patients and the hospital, and that somebody's going to capture it. Why not you guys, right? Why not carve out that space and then potentially expand? Um, and I think that would just naturally get people nodding as to, yeah, this is likely to be a market that maybe doesn't quite exist in the way that's commercially um, profitable at this exact moment, but it's going to grow into something. And this is my chance to become almost like your, your AI kind of cars, right? Most people can imagine a scenario where cars are driving around that are machine learning and are moving around. That's not really what it looks like at the moment, but it's not hard for people to agree that's likely to where it's gonna go. And that's why people are investing to capture a bit of the market probably try and adopt similar type of uh, formula or framework for your type of pitch to get people naturally agreeing with it less about kind of whether it's 
um, how big the monitor is or whatever. That's, that's like the detail that's going to be of a minor issue in, in regards to people agreeing that they think it's going to go into a good place. Um, and I, yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea. I don't know what, what your competitors are like. So I don't really know your landscape in terms of your pricing and what, what people are willing to pay. The, the one question I would have is, is there a way of you presenting this type of solution as a cost saving um, product and service? I.e., if you put a financial cost that as a nurse going around to each patient of how much time and overhead and training goes into that, or what they could be doing that's of higher value if they weren't doing the, the kind of lower, lower, lower value tasks to the point whereby actually you can make the case that for each one of these units, you're actually saving money by paying us to do that automatically compared to having to have a manual person go around and do it. But if you could do that, I think that would also help get people into this set. Would scale up and be of value to lots of people. But those are my thoughts. Good. Just, I just it. one follow up, which was so you said don't go for the monetary slide, like the slide that's talking about numbers, like you shouldn't really have that slide on. Is that what you meant? Uh, the, which one do you remember about? The numbers in terms of, oh, how much your, your, your um, wristband and, and, and that type of stuff. Is that what you meant? Right, right. So you just mentioned that, that, I, shouldn't have, that I should focus more towards showing the large, much larger picture for the years to come rather than kind of going to the details, right? So by the Not details, what do you mean? I, I would switch okay. them. I'd get the big vision, right? Um, essentially, if you want to use an analogy, I'd start with, we want there to be a, a personal computer on every desk in every home, right? And we think this is where it's going to go. And I think naturally, with your type of claim, we think every patient is going to have monitoring devices on them. We want to claim a share of that market. Um, because realistically, it, I'm not, we're, not, we're not investing in it because we think it's going to become profitable in six months' time. It's a long-term play. And so it doesn't really matter whether your device is $200, $300, $500. Like, I probably don't even know what your competitors cost. I'm probably not familiar with that landscape. And to some extent, probably doesn't matter in the sense that they're going to test out different ones in different parts of the country or the world and the, the one that works best and, and kind of plays out in terms of getting people to adopt it will probably be the one that's the area and preferred option. Um, so yeah, still have numbers in there, obviously, but that's not going to be a point whereby, oh, it's only $200, therefore I'm going to write you a big check, right. or oh, it's $300, therefore I'm not. Kind of, I don't think that's going to be a big pivotal part in someone's decision-making, whether they think ultimately the business is going to be successful and if I think it's going to be successful this pie do I want basically so that'll be cool. my feedback on that one thank you so much that was some great feedback generally and I never thought about it from that perspective at all that structuring makes so much more sense thank you very much um, Craig any comments or no there was some some invaluable feedback there um, I, again, I really like the proposition. Um, just, just on on um, barriers to entry for, for for approvals for hospitals is is there, is there a regulatory process that you need to go through in addition to to having hospitals accept it? What's the what's what's the process is there? So you do need to get it FDA approved. There's an entire five ten k medical device pathway that we need to follow. But the good part is complicated because like 10 k pathway says a few devices that we've approved devices similar. You just need to show equivalent devices So you don't do some clinical trials in order to prove what you're doing. It has to be fully complete. Okay, so you right, need to so do you need you? to do clinical validation in order to Get to the regulatory stage. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just, just a, 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 a chaos. No, but it's, it's, it's a, um, a wonderful, a wonderful application. Other than that, I thought the pitch, I thought the pitch went very well. And other than that, just points. Nothing really to add. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you stop sharing your screen now, and then we'll sure. have a quick word out there. 
I just want to say thank you so much for having me here, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the feedback as well. It's, it's you're, you're really welcome. Just just one final question: Where is the company based? So it's based in India and California. Okay. Uh, and the company you're raising against or raising for is based in India. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, now we've got a couple more people on here. I don't know. Is there anybody else who wants to? practice the pitch here now. Um, I haven't got any more in the... Just shout out if you do. Okay. Um, Fazani, you had a question earlier. Did you want to come back um, to me on that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. My question is that what's ISA is a stand for? And I'm also a new startup as well. Okay, uh, S, are you, do you mean SCIS? Yeah, exactly that one. <laughs> exactly that one. Okay. Um, it's a government, UK government um, incentive for um, angel investors to invest in early stage startup companies, which okay. gives basically the investor the ability okay, to them. claim a 50% tax rebate and various other advantages um, going forward. Okay. It's something, if you're going to raise in the UK as a UK company, it, it, you, you have to have, basically. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problems. Um, um, Neil, yes. uh, just, uh, just have one question. Yeah. When will you be running the next workshop like this? Okay, hang on, I'll tell you. Because um, I have learned after doing this session that um, I do need to work on the pitch deck and I want to come back and present again. Yeah, sure, no problem at all. We're doing them weekly at the moment, um, oh, same cool. time next week. Okay, uh, that's 20, great, We've got a, Tonight we've got an actual pitch event, which okay. you're more than welcome to sort of log into and have a look. Um, okay. Just anybody out there, I'll just put my um, um, most of you have got my details, but um, yeah. I'll just pop those in there for you. If you've got any questions or anything like that, and our website is www.eventual. Have you lost? Okay. Uh, if you go on there, it's uh, under virtual events, you'll see all the links to our up and coming events and, and such like. You can just be able to go on, register on, um, what do you call it, event. Right? No problem. That's great. Thanks a lot, anyway. For okay, now you're more than welcome. So, yeah, the pitch, then we, we, we've got a practice pitch again on, say, on the 22nd, which is obviously next week. Uh, then on the 24th, we've actually got a workshop. 22nd of June. 20. Okay. Sorry, 24, you have again a workshop? 24 of June? 24 of June, we've got a workshop. The difference between this, this one, which is a practice you pitch, is the workshop one is where we get into all the nitty gritties of what you actually need to raise money, how you do it, how you attract investors, what your legals need to be. We cover SCIS, EIS, Advanced Assurance, all the exciting stuff that you're going to need to raise money. Okay. Okay, uh, and then at the end of the month, on the 29th, we've got another pitch event. So, and that's much the same going forward. Um, regular workshops, regular pitch practice events, and regular pitch events. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, but that's great. Well, thanks very much for everybody for coming along. Uh, Richard, I'll, I'll drop you up. I'm sure I've got your details. I'll drop you a line. We'll have, we'll have a chat, um, if that's okay. Oh, you've just gone. No. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, okay, yeah. Sure. Yeah, no problems at all. Thanks very much for your input today. Okay. Um, I, also, what I'll do, um, just for a friendly go, I'll send everybody a link to the video here and also what's in the chat so you can reference it later. That'll come from our Dropbox file for now. Okay. Right, well, again, everybody, wherever you are, have a good rest of the day or evening and um, thanks very much. We look forward to seeing you at our events.
Yeah, I'll give you a quick buzz now, yeah? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank, okay. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.